it's always great when the speaker does their own technical support. Um, so uh, it gives me great pleasure to, uh, to introduce one of our own. It's always fun to have one of our own giving the colloquium. Uh, our speaker today is Professor Andrei Nevodomsky. Uh, Professor Nevodomsky got his doctoral degree at Cambridge uh, in the UK in 2005. Um, he did a uh, postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Sherbrooke in Canada, and he also did some time as a postdoc at Rutgers, if I'm recalling correctly. And uh, he joined us here at Rice in 2010 and has been an you know, active, extremely participatory member of the Condensed Matter Group. And, uh, and he was promoted uh, to associate professor in 2017, right? And, uh, and uh, today he is going to tell us about fun with spins, quantum spin solids and liquids. Thank you so much, Doug. All right, am I being heard well on Zoom? Can somebody on Zoom unmute them and say if you can hear me? Yes, How about you can hear in the back. Okay. Yes. Awesome. Wonderful. All right. Um, this thing worked a second ago, but now it wouldn't. Let's see if this works. Yes. Okay. Um, all right. So today I'm going to tell you about fun with spins, uh, spin solids and spin liquids. I'm going to tell you what a spin solid is, um, such as this thing over here, where the uh, ovals correspond to the spin singlets on some bonds. And then we'll try to make a spin liquid out of spin solid. How we do this? Well, one obvious suggestion is that we could try and melt it. Um, now, the problem with that is that what you end up with is not a spin liquid, but more akin to a spin gas. Because you just have a bunch of disordered spins that are totally not talking to one another, and there are no correlations in a paramagnet. So instead, I'm going to ask a question about how create not a spin gas, but rather something, this is an artistic interpretation of a spin liquid. Okay, I don't know if you like it, I like it. Um, and I'll talk more about the actual science, hard science before that. Now, um, before we proceed, let me ask a question that might seem redundant. What is spin? So I bet if I ask a random undergrad or grad student in the group, probably the answer will be somewhat along these lines. Uh, it's an internal magnetic, um, internal spin or magnetic moment of a particle, maybe electron, and that's what it is, right? And we take it for granted. Uh, now, it wasn't always like this, and the story goes back to 1920s, where Sam Goldsmith and George Bullenbach asked that same question. And they wrote this influential paper in mid-1920s, um, suggesting that actually it's a, if you wish, the fourth angular momentum. Think back about the Bohr atom, N, L, and M, quantum numbers. This is number four. Um, and of course, they were aware of the criticism that are going to come their way. One of them was the fact that if you literally imagine the electron spinning, then there would be a problem with the speed of light, or exceeding the velocity of the speed of light, assuming some typical radius for the electron. Now, that didn't stop pulling back and gouts They says, well, you know, it's quantum mechanics, it's mysterious, you know, maybe electron is smaller than you think, you know, let this be. Um, now, a much more serious criticism came from this gentleman. Now, Hendrik Lorentz of the Lorentz invariance um, was at the time already Nobel laureate in physics, hugely influential uh, figure, and his criticism was as follows. That if you take the energy corresponding to the magnetic moment divided by C squared, or as it will, convert it into appropriate units, you will find that the radius of the electron would have to be too large to match with other expectations. Okay? Now, I'd have to ask my energy colleagues, what the heck do I mean by the radius of the electron? I honestly do not know. Maybe there is a way to um, estimate this from QED, and I'll, I'll talk about QED a little bit later. But the criticism was so severe that Ullenbach, and it was a polite criticism, but it was so striking that Ullenbach and Goudsmith wanted to retract their paper, which was already submitted. To which the advisor said the following, you are young enough to be able to afford the stupidity. So, so this is something that I think every PE advisor should tell their students. Don't be afraid to make mistakes. Sometimes cool mistakes come with great results. Um, now, perhaps the staunchest critic of all of this was Wolfgang Pauli, who was famous for not matching his words, and he said, essentially, it's another Copenhagen heresy. I guess he didn't like Niels Bohr very much, um, and that was it. And nevertheless, that's one of the ways how we currently understand spin. Um, in fact, if you were to travel to Leiden in the Netherlands, like I did a couple of years ago before pandemic, you will find that they have these buildings um, with the formulas written on them. 
And this particular one, which is the picture of, if you look on the left, it has the electron spinning in a quasi-classical fashion, one direction, on the right, the Raza, and the names of Fulham, Beck, and Gautzman. So I thought that was kind of cool. Now, more seriously, if you ask somebody, I don't know, like Matt Foster, who's more mathematically minded than me, he would say, well, actually, spin is, you know, actually, you should think of it as a label that labels the irredu irreducible representations of a spin rotation group. Now, there's one problem with that. When you taught quantum mechanics, you know that angular momentum only takes integer values. And how do I reconcile this with the electron pattern spin half? Well, it turns out this was figured out by Herman Weil, who referred to them as double values or, in modern language, projective representations of the group. And it's double valued in the sense that if you take, if you start with an electron um, in an upstate and, and you do a 360, I should have closed this bottle before, right? If I did a 360 rotation, you see, I didn't quite end up where I started. I have to do another rotation clockwise to get back. Can you see that trick? Okay, so rotate a cuff problem. But generally, uh, this tells you that if you rotate things by 4 pi, that's how spin half of the electron comes back to itself. Now, um, the reason why I'm telling you all of this, this is before the talk even started, is to tell you that there is a fundamental difference. Not all spins are created equal. And in particular, there is a difference between spin half and spin one. Now, for those of you in high energy, of course, this comes as no surprise. Some are fermions, there's a bosons. Let me say that for the rest of the talk, I'll happily set the speed of light to infinity. I'm never going to worry about Lorentz invariance and none of that, OK? And nevertheless, I'll claim that there is a still important difference between spin half and spin one. And that's what this talk is about. And to proceed, I'll tell you first about the conjecture. And I'll tell you about the theorems. And then I'll tell you about various spin solid and spin liquids for those spin half and spin one magnets. OK. Can anybody tell me who this gentleman is? How about now? <laughs> yes. OK. So I had to tag up the picture. That's what Duncan Haldane looked like when he was formulating his theory in the early 1980s. Um, so indeed, Duncan Haldane got the Nobel Prize largely for his contribution to biological physics. Not only this, but this was one of the major reasons why. What Haldane was trying to understand is precisely whether there's a difference between spin half and spin one. And the way he proceeded is by formulating the simplest spherical cow model, which is a spin chain. Okay, you have a bunch of spins that are aligned in a chain. Um, somebody like uh, Randy Hewitt here can do this in the AMO experiment, where he has one-dimensional tubes. And if you put an optical lattice, that's roughly what Haldane was after. Now, the way he tackled the problem is that he took a quantum spin and decided to represent it in a semi-classical fashion. And to do this, you could kind of trace the slow degrees of freedom by, so this minus one, the staggered magnetization here shown, for instance, with the red or the blue color, you see how smoothly it changes, as opposed to the ragged up-down, up-down motions, which correspond to the fast, rapidly varying degrees of freedom. Now, if you integrate out those, what Haldane showed is that actually you end up with what was already known to his theorists as a nonlinear sigma model, plus something else, and that's something else is the topological term. It's called a theta term. For obscure historical reasons, I don't know. Um, but it's the same theta that appears in, for instance, QCD when people talk about the theta vacuum. Not the same exact theta term, but the same spirit. OK, so let me first decode this for you. There won't be that many equations, by the way, in this talk, so don't get scared. Um, but let me talk about the first term. So when I look at this, well, what is this? Um, well, if I pull out the, the term and write this like this, well, it looks like a differential equation. And if I were to take a time derivative, you see that what it gives you is a linear dependence between the frequency and momentum. In fact, what this is, is nothing else but a Goldstone mode. And an L3 symmetric model, it's a magnet. So here's a result from our own Feng Chen Dai, who's here in the audience, of inelastic neutron data on barium-122. It's an iron uh, nictite compound. And you could see this beautiful linear dispersing peak. Of course, as you go towards the edge of the Brion zone, the dispersion stops being linear. But in the low energy theory, which is what this is valid for, you get essentially linear dispersion. Okay? So, so far, so good. Now, what about that, that famous topological term? Well, it turns out if you stare at this, um, what multiplies the coefficient theta, that double integral that you see behind me, is actually an area subtended on the unit sphere by the end of the arrow as it takes the unitary evolution in time. 
And it turns out that when you exponentiate the action, which is what we're told to do, you end up with a geometric face, and that's known by the name of the very face. Um, which, by the way, at the time when Haldane was writing this, Michael Berry's papers weren't written yet. Um, but now we know this is a Haldane face. So moreover, what's interesting is that this phase over here, multiplying theta, actually is an integer. So let me try and convince you why. Okay, so we have, if you look at this expression, right? Uh, let's put mathematician's hat on for a sec. You have temperature, sorry, you have T, which is time, and you have X, you have a double integral. So this tells you what? You have to integrate over these two coordinates. And then what is the so-called target manifold is where does this M take values? Well, M is a, in a semi-classic approximation is a unit vector, so it lives on a surface of a sphere, okay? And so what we're looking is a set of maps that take this plane in time and space and map it onto a sphere. Now here's a cool trick that mathematicians do, it's called stereographic projections. What you could do is to map the plane onto a sphere, or the other way around, um, as shown here. You take from the North Pole, you go through the point P on the sphere, and you end up with the point P prime on the plane, and you could map out the entire plane this way. Now, why, I'll tell you in a second, but for those of you, so how many of you are familiar with stereographic projection? How many of you have seen this before? Especially students. Okay, some. Okay, this is something you could do at home. Um, this is actually a person's fingers holding a cell phone with the light on. Now, that's, okay, so this, I, I tried to do this, but I, I failed miserably. I think you need a 3D printer or find it on Amazon. But this is some sort of a three-dimensional, you know, structure that you could see here. But what's cool about this, I mean, all this is, right, is a surface of sphere with some holes. But if you shine the light through the North Pole, you end up with a very nice square lattice. Now, what is stereographic projection? I take a point in the square lattice, and I map it back onto a sphere by drawing a straight line from this point to the North Pole where the, the light of the, um, of the cell phone is. Now, I can do it with multiple, multiple arrows, and you see that if you give me some field configuration, I'll do it again, if you give me some field configuration, some distribution of arrows on the plane, I could tell you what it would look like after I've put them back on the sphere. And now what you have is on each point on the sphere, you have a blue arrow which can point somewhere on a block sphere. So it's a mapping of a sphere into another block sphere in this case, okay? And it turns out that what this coefficient Q quantifies is the way in which this can be done. And it turns out that it's labeled by integers and the two sets that are labeled by different integers can't be smoothly deformed into one another. This one looks like more like a hedgehog, and the key difference is that that spin pointing up here now points down. There is no way to smoothly distort the left picture into the right. It's like trying to comb the sphere, for those of you who are familiar with the mathematical theorem. In the mathematical language, it turns out that that integer is the label of the so-called second homotopy group, and it just tells you that there are integer number of ways, technically infinite number of ways, of trying to put the blue arrows on top of a sphere in unique ways that can't be smoothly mapped onto one another. Okay, now what does it have to do with Haldane? Haldane pointed out that if you look back at his theory, this coefficient Q was appearing in the exponent. And what you have to do is to sum over all possible field configurations, so field theories that should be familiar, and that includes summing over all of those topological sectors made labeled by Q. And what's interesting is that the coefficient theta is actually two pi times s. That's Haldane's key contribution. And what he noted is that s is integer, then actually summing over all of these topological sectors is kind of mundane. Because you just get e to the power two pi times imaginary unity, and you just get one. But if you're trying to do this for the high half integer spins, that's where the surprise comes in. You end up with the phase, which is pi mod two pi, and so you have an alternating signs of all of these terms. What is the end result? It was known back from the 1960s that if you actually try to do this in for spin half, using so-called beta ansatz technique, you could show that the result are some quasi-particle spin-ons that disperse linearly. And that's very non-trivial result. They're not spin waves, they're not those magnons that I showed you earlier. There's a fractionalized excitations of which you'll hear more as we progress through the talk. But for the purpose of this, the key is that they form a gapless sort of diffuse spectrum of excitations shown here. This is an experiment done 
um, decades later after Haldane work, which was shown that on quasi one dimensional uh, systems of localized spins, you could actually see the experiment. Okay. So that led Haldane to formulate his famous conjecture. And that is that all integer spins behave differently than half integer spins, namely all integer spins are gapped, versus half integers can be made gapless. Doesn't mean they're always gapless, but they can be made gapless. Now, in some work already a long time ago, I've shown with uh, the students in my group that in fact this Haldane phase is very stable. We studied here the behavior of um, one-dimensional chain in the presence of the second, second nearest neighbor interaction and show that this blue Haldane phase indeed is very stable, okay? Um, I won't go into details of how we did this. This was done using so-called density matrix normalization group. I'll just say that this is an extension, a fancy extension of Wilson's numerical RG. It's a way of integrating out high degrees of freedom to get an effective theory describing the spin systems. And I'll tell you more if you're interested um, in the question session. But instead, what I'd like to do next is to tell you about the theorem. And these three gentlemen, they set out to figure out, can the difference between spin half and spin one actually be detected? I mean, of course, I just told you from Haldane that, yeah, they're not the same, but what would be the consequences? Now, they couldn't do much about integer spins, but for half integer spins, they made the following observation. Actually, it's a theorem. That if you take a one-dimensional system, with even number of spins and antiferromagnetic interactions, then the system is guaranteed to have at least one gapless excitation. Gapless means at zero energy in a the thermodynamic limit. Now, why is that important? Well, for starters, the example I gave you earlier, that of a spin half chain having gapless excitations, well, that's a partial example there are. That's an example where there is an entire tower, not just one, one state is guaranteed, but there is an entire tower of gapless state that descend down and that's what you see over here, right? And I also told you that the spin half systems don't have to be gapless, but they could make, maybe made gapless. So what I meant by this is there are actually examples where what you could always do is to try and pairwise bond the spins together into single singlet objects. And if you do this, well, it comes from the fact that you will have to now decide how to break the symmetry. You could, or rather, you number the spins, one, two, three, four, you either choose two to be coupled to three, in which case they're paired up, and that's it, or you choose one to be coupled to two. Now, that structure I showed you, that's the quantum spin solid that I showed you in the beginning of the lecture. That's what we're gonna try and melt to create a spin liquid, okay? And so the key here is that if you try to do it for spin half, you may get different results than if you did it for spin one. Now, this leap schultz matisse theorem has been extended further on by these two um, famous physicists, Masaki Oshikawa and Matt Hastings, um, who extended it to high dimension and showed that generically it works. And the modern formulation of the theorem is somewhat like this, that first of all, it's silent about integer spins, but it tells you that if you take a half integer spins, one of three things can happen. Either the system is gapless, which could be because it's magnetically ordered and it has Goldstone modes, or, it is gap, but then it must be topological and must have fractionalized excitations. And other than that, it, the only other way out is if you break the symmetry and form a quantum solid. So if we are after studying a liquid, that means we don't want the solid, we only have two choices. It has to be liquid, has to be either gapless, or it has to have these fractionalized excitations. And I'll tell you in a second what those are. But let's contrast this with, for instance, spin one systems, okay? So first of all, there is a vast body of literature on spin half restricted systems. I, I could give an entire lecture, in fact, I gave one earlier this summer in a summer school, where I could tell you a lot about what's known about frustrated spin half systems. By comparison, spin one systems have been studied much less, and that's one of the directions of my own research here at Rice. Now, why is that? Primarily for historical reasons. Um, but what would be the reasons for studying them? Well, I list here some of them. Well, first of all, spin one. Okay, you, you appreciate that if I make the spin to be very large, it essentially behaves like a classical object. We do not want that, right? So I want some quantum fluctuations, but spin should be large, but not, you know, larger than half, but not large, not too large. 
Second, and I will show you this in a moment, spin one allows for very interesting so-called spin nematic excitations because it has quadrupolar moments, something that spin half does not have. Now, I also told you that this leap schultz matisse oshikawa hastings theorem is actually silent about spin one, which means in addition to all of those possibilities I just told you, it tells you that there is more, and that's something I'm gonna explore today. And, you know, to reiterate the famous claim from George Mallory, because it is there, right? He was asked by a journalist, a stupid guy, why, sorry, he was asked by a journalist why he wanted to climb Mount Everest. Well, the answer was that, right? I mean, obviously. <laughs> Um, but on a serious note, it's because it is there. There are many compounds based on iron and nickel, um, which generally have spin one moments, and some of them um, I work on myself, some of them are actively being explored by function dye, for instance. All right, so here's one example of a spin one system, iron selenide, a material that myself, Feng Ching, and Emilia worked on, and what this is, is material that has a particular structure, but what's striking about this is that it has this, what I shaded here with the orange face at ambient pressure, which doesn't appear to have any magnetic order. Now that comes as a surprise. Um, nature pours vacuum, it doesn't like when the spins have residual entropy, they want to order, so why don't they? And the answer turns out to be quite simple. You see, when you're taught quantum mechanics and you're taught the spin half is like a qubit, it can point up, or it can point down, or it could point somewhere in the block sphere, right? Sounds familiar? Spin one has one more possibility. In fact, a multitude of possibilities, but that is that it could be in a z equals zero state. Now, that doesn't have dipole moment. It doesn't point anywhere. It doesn't point north, it doesn't point south, and no, it doesn't point on the equator. In fact, the best way to represent this is to say that there is a rod pointing in a z direction, and you have quantum fluctuations around that, but the spin itself can't be said to be pointing anywhere. The reason I said this is multitude of possibilities is because it's not just one such state. In fact, you could form an orthogonal basis. And if you take any linear superpositions of this x, y, and z with real coefficients, you get yourself what's known as a quadrupolar state. It's a state that has quadrupolar moment, but does not have magnetic dipolar moment. Right? So it behaves like L equal two object, not L equal one, if you wish. L being the, the angular momentum. And when you study the iron selenide that I mentioned earlier, what you find is that, at least at the mean level, I'll spare you the details of the actual model, what you find is that there is yellow regime over here, which looks ordered in this ferro-quadrupolar fashion, right? As opposed to a bunch of spins pointing up, down, up, down, as you would get for an amperometer. I appreciate that from your point of view, it may be difficult to see those green arrows, but yes, this meant to be spins pointing somewhere on the block sphere, and here there are these rods indicating the directions. Now, how do we know that this works? Well, it would be good to go beyond mean field, which we did, and the way you do it is that you look at the fluctuations, sort of harmonic theory, and you do it in a way we usually do, is that we describe the fluctuations by looking at the spectrum of excitations, at the, if you keep only quadratic term, they look like a bunch of decoupled harmonic oscillator, the bread and butter of quantum field theory. And from that, from the spectrum of these excitations, you could compute many, many things, including what neutron spectroscopies call dynamical spin structure factor. Those colorful pictures I showed you earlier and about to show you now is what that is. Now, what is shown here is with false color, the intensity of the scattering, shown in the reciprocal space. K and H here are the two directions, if you wish, along the X and Y directions of the green one zone. And what you see, the top row is the theory, the bottom is the experiment. And what changes from one panel to the other to the other is the value of frequency or the, the momentum, not momentum, the energy transfer, which was encoded, right? So the, the neutron source shines neutron onto the sample and the detector detects the amount of energy that it dumps into the, in this case, magnetic degrees of freedom. So that energy transfer, as it increases, gets to these things to disperse, and the relationship between the theory and experiment is quite striking. I mean, there are a bit more details in the experiment and a bit more noise, but generally, that's, that's the picture that we get. In fact, you don't even have to stop at the harmonic theory. We've done the density metrics formalization group calculations, of which I spoke earlier, which, sorry, and I went one more. 
slightly fast. And again, without going into too much detail, it tells you that indeed you have quadrupolar excitations, and indeed you could realize those phases of matter. Okay. Now, before I, before I proceed, so, so let me maybe pause here and, and kind of take stock of what I've told you thus far. Okay, so spin half and spin one are not created equal. In this talk, I wanted to focus on spin one, but you will see spin half, so you could appreciate the differences between the two. I've told you so far about the solids. Now, how do we make a liquid out of them, right? How do I make this artist rendering that I really like? Well, my suggestion is that you should melt the spin solid, but not melt by heat, but try to do it at zero temperature. So melting should be taken quote unquote. It means that you use quantum fluctuations to destroy the magnetic order. Now, what does it actually look like? Well, this is an example of a magnetic solid. Those purple, whatever, red bonds are the ones where the spins form spin half. And what the magnetic fluctuations do, you could imagine that they can try to rearrange these bonds in a fashion like this. I just drew one configuration. But of course, what you should do is to take, in a quantum mechanical sense, a linear superposition of all such possibilities. And this idea was first suggested by, uh, sorry about that, by P.W. Anderson, who called it a resonating valence bond. Now, that name, RVB for short, comes from what you probably know from basic chemistry. If you look at the textbook before 1960s, benzene ring was probably drawn like this or like that, where this meant to represent double bonds of the sp2 coordinated bonds. And now we talk about aromatic ring, and there is a depiction of this like this. So what does it mean? Well, it's the idea that it's not actually this or this, it's a quantum superposition of these two states, which means if you were to take a snapshot, you could find this or that, but with equal probability. Um, now, the idea here is very similar, except it's not just a hexagon. It's a lattice with macroscopic number of possible coverings. And, you know, dot, 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 there are many of them. And you're supposed to take all of them. And if you only have one particular realization, that's your solid, right? You're stuck in that position and you're done. But if you try to melt it, you end up with a sum over this state and this one and many, many more. And that's the Anderson's resonating valence bond. Okay, so that's the liquid we want to achieve. Now, here's the promised difference between half, spin half, and spin one. You see, in spin half, the Lipschultz, Matisse, Oshikawa, Hastings theorem, sorry, it's a, it's a mouthful. But that theorem I told you about, what it tells you is that one thing you could have is you could have a solid. You break the symmetries of the lattice, and you're in a solid state. Okay, we don't want that. We want to meld that. So what, what other options are possible? One is a gapless spin liquid, so which I will tell you in two minutes. Um, and the only other option it gives is so-called topological order, of which one example, of which I will not talk today, but it could be a subject of a talk of its own, are so-called Kutnaev topological spin liquids. Now, spin one systems can have all of those ingredients too. It could also be a valence bond solid, which we don't want. It could be a gapless spin liquid. It could be the one with topological excitations. But spin ones can evade the theorem because they they're not subject to it. And in fact, you could end up with so-called non-fractionalized correlated paramagnet, which is none of those possibilities that are only possible on the left. Okay? I'm gonna try and make a picturesque representation of this. Okay, imagine you are an Asian seafarer and you're starting somewhere from the coast of Europe. I think this is what this map is supposed to represent. Now, if you are an object that only has been half, you wanna save dry land, and that's your anti-ferromagnet or ferromagnet. And so if you think back of Landau, that's all what was known maybe in the 1960s. Okay. Um, now, later on, people realized that it could be islands of valence bond solid. That's the one I, I'm trying to melt to create a liquid. Now, what kind of liquids come? Oh, be, now be careful. Those are dragons. Um, and they could be gapless, or maybe they could be gapped, and voila. Okay, so you have an island, you have a safe dry land, and then you have this mysterious gapless spin liquids, to which the first one experimentally is still awaits to be realization, with one exception I'm going to about to tell you. So it turns out that most of the sea, experimentally, is still subject of intense debate, and people are still seafarers who are trying to explore distant lands. Now, what do spin one systems do? Well, they tell you that 
you could go to much hotter Spain and Portugal regions, maybe Ukraine somewhere here, which has this quadrupolar states, which aren't the same as the dipolar, spin, uh, as the dipolar states for spin power. But in addition, and this, unfortunately, I clicked on one. But in addition to all of this, um, you could also have, here we come, you could also have this fast C of what I call a correlated quantum paramagnet, right? which is not subject to Lipschultz Mitchell theorem, which evades all of those islands and gives you more possibilities. And that's why I argue it's interesting and important to study. All right. So let's talk about gapless spin liquids. They're by far perhaps the most interesting and intriguing objects. And let me try to explain why. You see, gapless by definition means it has zero gap. One could make this much more generic, but just by the dimensionless analysis, if you want to compute correlation length, I would have to have something of dimensional velocity here, but let, let's set this to one. It should be inversely proportional to the gap. So if the gap goes to zero, that means correlation length has to diverge. And yet I don't want to have longer and shorter state. How is that possible? And the idea is that you instead have algebraic spin-spin correlations. They decay, but they decay not as an exponential, they decay algebraically. And that brings a question. How could you possibly have this long-range power correlations, assuming that in condensed matter, you want to always start with a local Hamiltonian? Okay, maybe in, in a more, um, for like in less technical terms, we would like the Hamiltonian to be short range. We do not want an interaction between a spin city here and the one in the medical center. We ideally want this to be only between nearest neighbor suns. This is what naturally happens, for instance, in ultra cold atomic gases, because the atoms or the corresponding exchange between the spins happens because effectively you only have under valves interaction between the atoms, and that decay is very fast. So, how would you get something that looks like a logarithm? Or maybe R to the power minus one. When I gave, uh, last, time I, I think, last time I think I gave a talk here, I showed this picture um, of starlings. I mean, the closest things we have here in Houston are grackles. They're much more annoying and loud. Um, but what you could see if you travel to Denmark um, is that there is this huge collection of birds that form these intricate patterns in the sky. And sometimes the flocks could be you know, tens of thousands of birds. And this is fascinating because what you see here is an emergent behavior. Emergent in a sense that you have the flock behaving as a whole, even though it contains sometimes tens of thousands of birds. And why do I call this behavior emergent? Well, this was analyzed by Giorgio Parisi, who, since I last gave this, showed this slide, uh, won a Nobel Prize. Um, this was last year, but what Giorgio Parisi was studying, he was annoyed apparently by the flocks of the starlings flying over Rome, and he teamed up with biologist friends to try to understand why they fly in patterns. Now what biologists tell him, and I don't actually know where that piece of information comes from, is that on average, one bird interacts with about seven birds that it sees nearby. Okay, not with 10,000, only with seven. That's what I meant by a local Hamiltonian or short-range interactions. And yet, what ends up happening is if you compute velocity-velocity correlation functions, you find that they are correlated on much, much bigger scales. So this is a graphic representation. It's a 2D projection of the velocities of the flock of the bird. And they took a film and then extracted velocities and they plotted it here, where the center of mass has been subtracted. Okay, so if this was a random distribution of birds, all arrows would be pointing in different directions. That would be a gas of starlings. Um, what I mean by liquid of starlings is that there are blobs of this liquid that kind of tend to travel in the same direction. There are correlations that are built in. The same happens with spins in my story. And what's interesting is that if you look at the exponent, it's actually tremendously low. It decays very, very low. It almost approaches a logarithm. And this is where we don't know the reasons, but one could perhaps suggest that, that maybe this is an evolutionary behavior of starlings trying to avoid hawks and, and perhaps having this long range correlations, this emergent behavior benefits them in some way. Okay, this is way outside of, <laughs> of my field of expertise, so I, I, I'm not gonna tell you why starlings do this, but let me tell you why spins do that. So can you have such a gapless as in long range quantum spin liquids? 
but instead of birds think of spins? And the answer is yes. And in fact, surprisingly, the effective theory that governs that, in some cases, is quantum electrodynamics, where phon photons are the gapless excitations. I'll, I'll, I'll decode these words on the next slide, but for now, I just want to, to sink in that, that, that somehow there are interesting connections between QED, high energy physics, and what I'm telling you here today. And one of the ways how you could actually see it experimentally is in the compounds that are called quantum spinices. Okay, so I'm gonna take, take you on a journey where I'm gonna tell you in the next five minutes what the spinices are and why they're called so. And the reasons why they're called so, those are compounds that are formed of these tetrahedrons that are joined at the corners. In chemistry notation, this is called a pyrochlor crystal structure. And it turns out that if you look and if you put, for instance, in this case, holmium is a rare earth element that sits on each of those corners, it has an Ising-like spins that on each corner can point either in or out. And it turns out that the interactions are such that on average, you want to have zero magnetization coming in or coming out of this tetrahedron. So you want two spins always point in, kind of carrying in the magnetic moment, and two of them point out, as if the total, um, yeah, as if the total flux um, is equal to zero. And that reminds us of the structure of a water ice. So it turns out that if you look at the molecules in the water ice, there are so-called hydrogen bonds that are formed between this hydrogen and this oxygen. But because of the uh, covalent structure of the oxygen, um, it can at any given moment satisfy only two of those hydrogen bonds. And so as a result, two of the bonds end up being shorter and the other two being, end up being longer. So if you're in your mind, whenever the bond is short, you put the arrow pointing inwards, and whenever they're long, you put them outwards, you get this picture. Now, Linus Pauling, um, Nobel laureate in chemistry, back in the 1960s, suggested that regular water ice is actually much more mysterious than you think. And the reason is this, is because if you actually try and compute the total number of configurations, on this lattice, right? How many ways can I put the spins in and out that satisfy this rule? Or in other words, how can I satisfy this ice rule? Um, you end up with a number that scales as a power law of you know, some number. Right? And that tells you that if you take a log of this entropy, modulo Boltzmann constant, you get the entanglement entropy. Or pardon, not entanglement. You get an entropy, right? The famous formula that's written on the gravestone of Boltzmann. W, the number of configuration, is equal Boltzmann constant times log of n, or log of whatever, this number, okay? And so what you find is residual entropy. So Pauling suggested that had it not been for the fact that there are imperfections and inclusions and all kind of disorder in an actual water ice, it's never perfect, it would be a highly non-trivial solid, which is kind of liquid inside because it has this unsatisfied entropy that, you know, has to be quenched in some way. Um, and this is indeed seen, this is an influential paper which was published by now, well, two decades ago, um, of where the term spin ice was first coined. It's this holmium compound that it turns out that if you look, there is a difference, and this difference in the entropy is precisely the following entropy. But what's more, what's more interesting are the excitations in the spin ice. You see, if I take a perfect water molecule that is happy between these two hydrogen and oxygen. So, you know, I have this so-called ice rule. Imagine I want to violate this. I want to take this one spin in the center and flip it. And what will happen is that this guy over here will have three spins pointing outwards, and this tetrahedron here would have three spins pointing in, right? It wouldn't be the happy state, such as represented here. And you could think of it as a magnetic flux being depleted on the left, and there is too much of it on the right. In fact, these two guys are nothing else than Dirac monopole and anti-monopole. And the cool idea is that it turns out that you could try and separate monopole and anti-monopole apart. This is an artistic representation of this. You know, you do a bunch of these spin flips in a row. And this is so-called Dirac string that connects the monopole and anti-monopole. Right? When Dirac coined the idea of monopoles back in the 1930s, it was just an exercise in trying to write down classical electrodynamics and asking whether you could have point charges that carry magnetic charge. That's what these monopoles are. And this is literally it, right? Now, 
monopoles do not exist in our universe insofar as we know it. Uh, there are deep reasons for why a proton would not be particularly stable if there was too much of those objects present. Um, but that's the realm of the high energy physics that I'm not qualified to talk about. But it's interesting that in condensed matter you have this emergent phenomena, you have monopoles, you have anti-monopoles that are realized in these spin ices. Now what's interesting is what happens if you imagine this is a snake and make the snake its, eat its own tail. If you close the Dirac string onto itself, you end up with a structure that looks like this. And that happily doesn't carry any extra magnetic flux because it's all kind of goes into loops. And in fact, you could parse this loop one way around, or you could parse it in an opposite direction, okay? And that should remind you of the picture I showed you earlier. You could color double bonds this way, you could color double bonds this way. The fact that both are present and there is coupling between the two tells you that the actual quantum mechanical state is not the one on the left, and not the one on the right, but the linear superposition of the two, that's your resonating balance bond. And it turns out one could make the connection to quantum electrodynamics to be much more precise. One could write down a corresponding, I know the, the field theories would prefer Lagrangian here, but I wrote a Hamiltonian. But you could write down Lagrangian or Hamiltonian of QED, where you literally have the coupling between matter fields and the light photons, except what plays the role, so there is a dictionary involved, what plays the role of electric charges, they're not electrons, they're actually this visons, they're coherent propagating wave, wave factors. In addition, you have magnetic monopoles, which is not what standard QED has. And then what plays the role of the gauge U1 degree of freedom, the light, the photons, are, well, they're called gauge photons in that they transverse fluctuations of the spins. Okay. And there is a hierarchy to this. So this, this, this excitations, the phone excitations are gapless. And then if you want to create, let's say, two monopoles or two anti-monopoles, you have to pay an energy gap. Okay. Now, experimentally, uh, Peng Chung Dai sitting here, um, if I say something wrong, Peng Chung, you have to correct me. Um, so Peng Chung Dai sitting here, he did measurements on this new compound that was synthesized actually by Bin sitting here in the a, in a second row. Uh, Bin is a postdoc who spent our, you know, arduous months working at Schrodinger's on the floating zone. Um, yeah, I, 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 I'm, I'm measuring my voice here. Um, there is an apparatus that's used to grow uh, crystals, which involves laser beams, and it's called the floating zone technique. What Bin was able to achieve is to grow very large single crystals that were large enough to put them in the neutron beam and measure the neutron scattering. And what you see here is the energy the energy transfer of the neutrons versus Q, the momentum. Remember how in one of those pictures I said omega should be linear in Q and you should see this linearly dispersing modes? Well, there is none of that here. Instead, you see this mush, you see this sort of diffuse scattering, which is one of the hallmarks of what you would expect to see of a quantum spin loop. And if you look at, so this is a false column map looking at this from above in the KX, KY plane, Again, you see that actually it looks like there are no sharp bright peaks. Instead, you have these diffuse excitations. Um, there were measurements done in Emilia lab showing that specific heat um, does not show any signs of phase transitions. And what our job as theorists was to try to explain how exactly this happens and what is the underlying theory that works for this material. So this was done with collaborators of mine, which involved both finite temperature uh, exact generalization on state-of-the-art large number of sites, um, as well as classical Monte Carlo and spin dynamics. Um, I will only show you kind of one slide summary of what's involved in this type of calculation in Monte Carlo. Essentially, what you think of this is a classical spins that obey this equation is sometimes called a Landau-Lipschitz equation of motion for the spins. It basically tells you that the spin precesses in the external magnetic field. H here is not a field, it's a Hamiltonian, so it's S cross magnetization. And from this equation of motions, you, you proceed with doing what's known as molecular dynamics. You evolve the equations of motions, and you gather statistics about the spins. And from it, you could measure the spin-spin correlations, which is really the name of the game. I want to know how is the spin here correlated with the spin there, or how is a starling that flies in this direction on that side of the building correlated or not, with another one flying way on the other side, okay? And 
That's what goes into the heart of these calculations. If you do Fourier transform, you get those pretty pictures, which I showed you earlier. On the left is the theory, on the right is the experiment. And you could see that, so this is a theory with a bad choice of parameters. This is if you improve them, and it represents the experiment with semi-core integer. And you could do the same in dynamics to show that the theory and experiment, again, within, with some caveats, they match quite well. And that allows us to make a progress in understanding of this material and to prove, at least in so far as we know, that this is, as far as we know, the only well-established example of a quantum spin liquid in three dimensions. So that flock of starling, it's a unicorn. It's very hard to find. Maybe there are more, but there are caveats, there are disorder, and all kinds of other kind of things that include them. Now, in the remaining, yeah, less than five minutes, I'm gonna ask a question about, which probably for those of you in high energy will ask, well, you told us about gapless excitations, but all you showed us is pictures on neutrons, but can we actually see photons? Like, what does this photon that's supposed to be gapless, what does it look like, right? Can I actually see the, the magnetic light coming from the spin ices? So this is one experiment which was done um, with collaborators from Paul Scherer Institute. Um, this was done on a sister compound than the one I just showed you, Ethereum stunning. And what's shown here is an experiment which is state of the art. It's so called, so the beamline that they use has this new apparatus um, that was developed, which is called neutron backscattering. And what it allows you to do is to achieve the resolution, which is of the order of one micro electron volt. Now, for somebody like in cold atom physics like Randy, this is no surprise. Well, one micro V, I mean, they talk about temperature in micro Kelvin. But in condensed matter physics, to put it in perspective, you typically measure things in electron volts or milli electron volts, not micro electron volts. So the fact that they were able to achieve this very large resolution allowed us to try and map the predictions of these objects onto the theories that were known before. And the goal was trying to see how far down in energy can we get in order to see the excitations. And what emerged is the following. Unfortunately, no, we cannot directly see the photons. Even those micro EV energies are unfortunately too high. But what we could see is the indirect evidence of the photons strongly coupled to matter. You probably heard of the Cherenkov radiation the infamous blue light that you can see in the pictures, well, in the Hollywood movies when they show you the reactor core, right? So, so those are particles that travel faster than the speed of light in the medium. And of course, you can't exceed the speed of light in vacuum, but in the medium, you can. It turns out that in this experiment, the spin-ons, those fractionalized excitations that play the role of monopoles, they travel faster than the equivalent speed of light. And in the process of this emitter and cover radiation, and the presence of this radiation is indirectly inferred from a particular feature of, of how exactly this curve looks like. And if you want to compare with the QD, what's interesting is that you know, the, the typical energy scale for exciting a pair of monopole, anti-monopole we get is something like two micro electron volts. Okay? So if you remember what MC squared is, where M is electron mass, that's about one mega electron volt. So we have about 12 orders of magnitude between the universe in this crystal, right, and what we see here. So if you want to, you know, look at the energies, you don't need to go to reactors to you know, accelerate particles to giga electron volts. You just need to heat it up. Um, now, on that note, let me bring this slide that I'll, I'll try to summarize what I told you today. I said that the spins are not created equal. Spin half and spin one, they look different from one another. And this was formulated in a conjecture by Haldane and more rigorously in the theorem by Lina Schultz, Matisse, Oshikawa, and Hastings that I mentioned later. Um, the spin one models appear naturally in, in many compounds, and that's a good reason alone for studying them. But more interestingly, they allow for more complex solids, such as the quadrupolar phases shown here. And what's interesting in the second part of the talk, about, I told you about this gapless spin liquids with algebraically decaying correlations, which are truly emergent phases of matter. They're described in one instance by quantum electrodynamics, even though you're not actually talking literally about QED as in our universe, but the theory, the effective theory is the same. Moreover, they even have monopoles and antimonopoles and very interesting phenomena that appear there. 
And there is an ongoing quest. This was the last two minutes where I told you that there is a quest experimentally to try and see how far down in energy you could go. And ironically, it's the opposite from what the high energy people do. Um, in the sense that in the LHC, you try to accelerate the particle and smash them into one another. Here, by smashing neutrons into your spins, you're already at so high energies that the, the challenge is to get resolution high enough to be able to go to low enough energies. Um, and finally, I could have given you know, more than this talk, more than two of such talks on different examples of spin one, liquids and solids, um, obviously limited by time and location, so I'm not going to do any of this. So I'll conclude by acknowledging collaborators. There's a different postdocs and students in the first two rows who worked with me over the years. And at the bottom, there are experimental and theory collaborators, including Tong Chang, um, with whom I've collaborated on some of the projects I showed you today. And finally, I'd like to um, thank Chuck Lorre, Bill Prady, and Jim Parsons. Anybody knows who Jim Parsons is? Sheldon. Yes. Um, because of this. So thanks for the inspiration. Oh, maybe a mic, sorry. Um, otherwise the audience, oh, I can repeat the question. I'll ask one question before I have to run off to my yep. five o'clock Zoom. Um, If you look, and I ask this because I want to do the experiment, so if you look in these spin ices and you ask about um, things like the spin Sabak effect, so if I basically heat, you know, heat the material inhomogeneously, right, if I apply a temperature gradient to this thing, what are the propagating modes that are going to carry that thermal energy away? Is it going to be monopole, antimonopole pairs? Is it going to be visons and, you know, how, how should I think about that? So uh, it's an excellent question. So the concept of fractionalization is that they're not the ele electrons that are going to carry those heat and electric charge, but it's going to be precisely the particles you mentioned. So depending on the energy scales at which you probe, um, the visons, uh, let's see, let me show you this one again. So depending on the energy scales involved, both visons and magnetic monopoles might contribute just for the scale of ideas. This is of the order of, 0.1 Kelvin, between 0.1 and 0.5 Kelvin in the experiments, in the particular compounds I talked about. In your material, it might be a bit different. But we're talking about fraction of Kelvin. So, which means if you do the, the experiment at 5 Kelvin, all of this contribute. They're all excited. Yeah, so I was just curious on the, uh, the point that uh, you know, from the experiment, I So, what's interesting is that in all of the quantum spin look at in all of the quantum spin local candidate materials, people always argue that uh, you have a potentially spin-on, right? Fermi surface, and spin-on Fermi surface always expected to have a thermal conductivity, uh, uh, you know, extracting to zero temperature a finite value, right? Because you conduct heat, but still insulator. But, but this has never been seen by, by any, you know, extremely low temperature thermal conductivity measurement. I mean, the people always argue is it because uh, there's some sort of a, a spin gap. I mean, so, so up to this point, nobody has ever found the you know, gapless uh, quantum spin liquid that has a finite uh, thermal conductivity. So what's your comment on this? And so the other question actually is sort of a real question, looking at the data that you just showed by the, uh, the I mean, is this uh, excitation uh, magnetic or, or I mean, wh what is this uh, that's uh, being claimed here? Yeah, so the statement of what's being shown here is this, so this is a powder sample. So sure, 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 sure. And this is the spectrum of the spin-ons as they propagate Right, so, so the peak, the position of the peak, which is here about 0 0.5 Kelvin. Right. So, so but there. this is a claiming there's a gap, right? It's clearly, this looks like the gap is around, uh, what, 0 0.01 millivolt? Correct, and, and that's exactly what this is. So if you look carefully and try to extract what the gap is, right? How, how do you reconcile? A, okay, so how do you reconcile that with the uh, idea of a gapless, uh, you know, mode that... Uh, oh, right, 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 so no, th there is no contradiction. If you look at, uh, oh gosh, where is this picture? Sorry. Um, Let me put the animation, let me get to the, uh, let's see. Yeah, that's the slide I wanted, okay. So the, the gap you're seeing, this peak over here corresponds to this energy, the green band. So, so the fact that this is of the order of this gap to excite the pair 
is equivalent to saying that if you have monopole and antimonopole, to create them in the first place calls energy of the order of twice mc squared, m being the mass of the monopole. Um, and so the mass of the monopole in this case corresponds to you know, this energy scale. The photons would be way, way lower in energy. Like, they would be like a small, tiny speck right there, which is what, why my remark was that under present conditions of the experiment, perhaps this will improve, it's very difficult to get to the energy scales that are over there. We're talking about fractions of microeden. Okay, so, so the new information is that they claim there's a gap in the excitation continuum. Correct, which, which is not by itself claiming that it's, it's, sure. it's gap, that there are gapless excitations insofar as we believe, but no, we have not seen them directly. Is that expected theoretically? Or? Yes, the theoretical expectation is that they should be there, but the only way we see the effects is indirectly via this Cherenkov spectrum. So in some sense, you know, this massive monopoles and antimonopoles, they plunge through your QED vacuum, and in process of doing so, they excite the Cherenkov radiation, and the resulting shape of this curve reflects that. That's, that's sort of the indirect evidence. So this is probably a question for the experimentalists, but uh, I'll throw it out there anyway. So um, on data like this, um, this is presumably like neutron scattering. So how does, how does the experimental, uh, how does the experimental person understand what that excitation is? How do you know it's a spin on? How do you well, know it carries spin? Right, so, so, okay, so I guess this could be done with this polarized spin flip scattering. I, I, I admit I don't know how whether this was a polarized source or not. Uh, but, yeah, there should be, yeah, the, the signal would be way too low. But, but right, so, so there are other measurements indicative of the fact you could look in the so-called spin flip and non-slip scattering, not at this energy, at, at high energy somewhere here, and show that what you see indeed the result of the spins, not phonons, not, not some other degrees of freedom. But to say that this came directly from, uh, in the previous slide, um, to, to claim that it came, let's say, from monopoles and not, let's say, from visors, that yeah, requires but, detailed but, modeling. But that's not an experimental measurement. I mean, that's what, you know, an idea that this is what the phase diagram looks like. But how do you know that that is actually carrying spin? Maybe, maybe, maybe Feng yeah, Chung. Yeah, 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 Feng Chung can answer that better. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, uh, please go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Well, what's it? I mean, yeah. maybe let me just add one more sentence, and that is that in analogy with uh, maybe high energy uh, spectroscopy, and what I'm showing here is intensity as a function of energy. You look at the spectrum of LHC, probably pro properly processed with background subtraction, and you see a peak. Like, how do you know that that peak came from Higgs particle and not from, I don't know, something else, you know, I don't know, charm quark? Well, you don't without you know, detailed theoretical calculations, computing branching ratios, figuring out what your detector possibly have detected, right? So, so there is some theoretical work and analysis that needs to go in in order to make any statement that, like, if, if that's all there was, then you say, well, it's a curve with a bump in it, right? Um, so that's why we're trying to do this additional analysis theoretically uh, to try and, and see what does it mean. And to the best of our understanding, the meaning is that the exciting pairs of magnetic monopoles, and the energy corresponds roughly to the energy of this peak. Are there any other questions for Andre? So I'll ask a slightly technical question. So, so the classical spin assay can kind of think of as something like an icing system in the sense that things are just pointing in or pointing out. Usually, this is just my ignorance, so usually when people talk about um, you know, emergent photons and emergent gauge theories in the context of quantum magnets, the idea is that you, you represent the spins in terms of some slight particles and you have to enforce a constraint and then that's where the gauge field comes in. 
Um, so is this, so is the, the quantum spin ice, I guess, is not uh, SU2 symmetric, presumably, because it's closer yep. to an Ising system. So how, how should I think about the emerging, the emergent photon and the U1 yep. is just the conservation for the slave spin-ons? Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, so, okay, so, so what, what Matt is asking is that if the spins are classical, and as that is the only value you've got, that, that theory is kind of classical. How do you get quantum out of it? And, and the answer to your question is that no, it's not a SU2 rotation and symmetric. There is a strong SZ component, but, and sorry, I'm going through detail of this, there is what, what this J curve appearing here is if you wish X, Y, X, X, Y, Y interactions. So there are terms that um, do not conserve the Z quantum number. And this is like X, Y, Z model, if you wish. But the coefficient of this xy term is much smaller than jz. And that gives you, well, in this case, dimension full coupling constant. Uh, if you ask me for what the ratio is in our material, j perp over jzz is of the order of 0 0.2. By the time you cube it and, and try to figure out what the scale being involved, um, that gives you the scale of how um, these coherent fluctuations can happen. And it turns out that's precisely the scale involved in, in this um, visons. So the visons, the, 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 like if, if I only had a classical spin ice, I would have only the orange part, the magnetic monopoles and nothing else. Right? So I can flip them and that's it. They have no dynamics of their own. Once created, they're boring, they just sit somewhere. Right. But if you allow for quantum components, you end up in directions of visons with the gauge fault. And I, th I should think of the visons as being like Slave spin-ons, or as well, slave, yeah. How should I think of them? It, it's a dual, um, so in, in the electromagnetism, if, if the spin-ons are the divergences of the magnetic field, yeah. then the visons are divergences of electric field, which is what you would call normally a charge in yeah, QED. Okay. So if you will, the orange is the magnetic charge, the blue is the electric charge, and they're dual to one another, but they live at different energies. Okay, thank you. Okay, well, let's thank Andre again. So, so the, the, the way to think of this is if you had, um, it, if you had a, a universe in which there were, there were electrons, right? How would you know that the electrons would be there? And the answer here is that for typical experiment, the temperature is high enough that it's above the MC squared, the twice MC squared. So you could create the electron positrons out of vacuum, right? So we are not in that regime typically, right? We're at, at room temperature, we are far below the scale of one mega electron. But in these materials, in this imaginary universe, with imagine, not imaginary, but a, an effective QED description, you're the temperature where what you're asking me is naturally being created without you, you know, wanting or not wanting to do it. And on top of it, when you shine neutrons on it, that's precisely what you're probing, right? Neutrons never probe ground state. They probe excitations from ground state to excited states. And then you ask, well, what are those excitations? Those are exactly these bisons and magnetic molecules. Right? So, so, so the answer is that yes, the spins are not just static as that pointing in or pointing out, either because of temperature, they fluctuate, or because you kick them with the neutron and transfer energy, you create a bunch of monopoles. It's really like a LHC, a reactor, right? You come with a neutron, you, you whack it into the system, and all of these new particles dissipate, and, and you observe at their effects. Yeah, so, so if you don't shine a neutron, I guess this material is there, like it, it might not have this kind of like, excitation. 
Uh, well, because the neutrons excite them. Correct. Neutrons excite them, but in addition, as I said, the temperature is quite high relative to the energy. So even if you don't shine any neutrons on them, it's like early early days from, from Big Bang, right? Early seconds, I should say. You have a hot plasma. There are excitations in it just because the temperature is too high. You don't have free electrons, you don't have atoms yet. Because the temperature is so high, things are constantly... That's the field we're in. That's what I meant, that we are in a kind of opposite regime from LHC. Yeah, too hot. <laughs> okay. Thank you.